Uh, we'll give you guys a second to get to your seats. Are you guys enjoying the beautiful spring-like temperatures outside this morning? Woo. I left. I left the house this morning. I didn't have my coat on, and I thought to myself, I got my leather seats and my 39-degree tower. I'm like, woo, it's a little chilly in here. Yeah. So. Let, let's uh, let's let's keep praying for a, a quicker transition this spring. <laughs> All right. Well, if you remember, a couple weeks ago we started our um, kind of just getting back to the basics uh, lesson. And last week we, we paused. We had Brother Alex was presenting uh, Bibles for China, and so we're going to pick back up uh, where we left off uh, a couple weeks ago. And so I'll just reiterate a little bit of the information since it's been a couple weeks. Um, if you remember, we really looked at uh, the three foundational pillars of Christianity. Uh, we looked at uh, the fact that there is a God, right? And that's the first one that we started to look at uh, two weeks ago. And we talked about how the second foundational pillar is that the, the, word, of, the word, the Bible, is his word. And then the third foundational pillar is Jesus is his son. And then, so all of Christianity rests upon the fact that there's a God, the Bible's his word, and Jesus is his son. And as we looked at it, we started to get into uh, the first foundational pillar. Uh, we started in Romans 1, uh, chapter 1 and verse 20. And I mentioned how, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, his divine nature have been clearly seen, uh, being uh, understood through what has been made so that we are without excuse. And so we started to look at Romans 1. Uh, we looked at, we went back, looked at Genesis 1, right? In the beginning, God created. And so then we started to really kind of get into, um, you know, who is God? What does the Bible say? The Bible doesn't try to prove God's existence. It simply uh, explains him and shows him as he is. And so we talked about, we looked at scriptures that shows that he's all-knowing, he's all-powerful. Uh, we looked at various scriptures that says he's ever-present. Uh, and so we're going we're gonna to continue on with that theme here today. There is a correction I need to make. Um, on Sunday, from the pulpit, I, I, I did from the memory verse, I said, uh, Christy uh, corrected me when I got home. I said, uh, I said you're, not, you're not getting out of this week's memory verse, but somehow you got out of it because I gave you the wrong memory verse. I said Romans 16, 16 instead of Mark 16, 16. But the ones who had their sheets and were following along knew that I messed up. But nobody corrected to me until I got home, and my wife corrected me, of course. And I went back and I uh, reviewed the tape, and the, yeah, I said it three times wrong. Not just once, but three times. So Mark 16, 16, right? Uh, to, all who are believe and, to all who believe and are baptized shall be saved. To those who disbelieve shall be condemned. So that's your memory verse uh, for this week. Um, so we're already on number three, right? So... As we continue this on, as we continue going with our memory verses, this is going to help us to uh, be able to hopefully uh, share the plan of salvation with our friends and family. The other thing I wanted to bring up is I was talking to a couple people when it comes to the memory verse. Um, you know, we've all heard, and I said this before, right? As we get older, even myself, as we get older, our memories aren't really what they used to be, right? But sometimes we use that as an excuse just to not really want to put the effort in. But in, in some cases, it's true, right? We have a harder time memorizing longer passages. So this is the other aspect. You don't have to always have every verse memorized, but what if you knew where to go, right? So to hear, what was the first memory verse? Romans 10, 17. Well, maybe you don't know that faith comes from hearing, hearing by the word of God or the word of Christ, as some translations say. But you know that to hear is the first step of the plan of salvation. I know I can go to Romans 10, 17. So instead of memorizing the whole verse, what if you memorize where the verse is? Then you open up your, most of the time, smartphone or, you know, physical Bible if you have it. Then you can go to that one. The next one's believe, right? And so we looked at Hebrews 11, 6. Uh, now Mark 16, 16. Next week, John 8, 24. So if you don't actually have the whole verse memorized, what if you had the actual just passage, you know, where to go to find out where to believe, where it says to hear, where it says to uh, confess, where it says to be baptized, right? So there's another way to do it. And Christy's got a funny look on her face right now. <laughs> and so that is the other thing. Me and Jim were actually talking about that at the house the other day. 
<laughs> and, and so that, that's more for, you know, our, our older folk, you know, our younger folk. I, you know, I expect us to memorize it. No, but, but if you said ouch, then you, you identified yourself as older. Because really, I mean, you know, you're identifying whatever you want, you know. So. <laughs> Uh, John 8.24 will be next week. This week's is Mark 16.16, 16, since I gave you the wrong one. She asked. Yeah. So, and there are some sheets still on the, on the back there, on the clipboard, if you want the various memory verses, and then we'll add more uh, down the road. But that is basically the plan of salvation. Tom, did you have it? Oh, I got it. But yeah. For the younger kids, not for those older people. Yeah, yeah. I know a lot of you guys are older. No, no, no. no. Hold on a second. On. For the younger kids, you can take a picture of that thing, okay? Hold on to the picture, and, and in, in about two seconds, you'll get a little text box, and it converts the whole thing to text. Yeah. Now you can search on um, memory birthday. I love just, it. Just say it. For your younger kids. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm not sure which side of the fence you're on. But yeah, I mean, you you get to determine what side of the fence you fall on, whether you're that younger or older, you know. So, all right, let's get back into it. So, I wanted to just make sure we corrected that. So, as we get back to, um, you know, God, looking at the fact that He is real, looking at the fact of what the scriptures have to say about it, I, I read a little bit from uh, Convicted. Um, La or two weeks ago, and in, in, in the book Convicted by Brother Brad Harab, he, he mentioned that there's seven uh, ways to prove the existence of God. He says, number one, you can look at every creation must have a creator. Uh, he mentions that every design, well, must have a designer. Uh, code requires someone to program the code. Law requires a lawgiver. Uh, he spoke about the law of cause and effect. He spoke about the law or the existence of morals, right? Uh, he also spoke about communication requires a communicator. And so he mentions there's seven things that, that you can look at from really a scientific point of view to, to prove God's existence. And we went through and we, we read a little bit of it, uh, a few of the uh, paragraphs from his uh, book. But I'm going to actually read you something now that kind of gives you the idea of if there's design in nature, then it, there needs to be a designer, right? And so listen to some of this information. Our universe operates using scientific, uh, exact scientific laws. Man doesn't create the scientific laws. We simply just identify them, right? We've named them. Scientific laws are laws because they are true and undeniable in any and all situations that they've been tested. That's why we consider them uh, scientific laws. Uh, in order for there to be laws, there must be, well, a lawgiver. And that goes back to what Brother Har Harib was talking about. The precision of the universe and the exactness of these laws allow scientists to launch, launch rockets to the moon. They allow scientists to la launch rockets to Mars and to put the little Mars rover and we drive it around with a little remote control with our cameras and take video and pictures. And, but they're only able to do that because of the exact laws of science that we have not created, but we have simply identified and named. And so such precision and exactness allow astronomers to predict eclipses uh, many years before they happen, as well as determine the next time you'll see Halley's Comet coming around, if you remember that from many years ago. And so such design demands a designer. We live in a tremendously large universe. While the outer limits have not yet been measured, it is estimated to be as much as 20 billion light years in diameter. Think about that. 20 billion light years in diameter. A light year is the distance travel, or is the, is the distance light travels in one year, moving at a speed of more than 186,000 miles per second. A light year is approximately 5.8 trillion miles. I mean, it just it just it literally blows your mind, right? Uh, these are there is an estimated 1 billion galaxies in our universe and an estimated 25 sex sectillion stars. That's 25 with 21 zeros behind it. I, I didn't even, can't even comprehend that. The Milky Way galaxy in which we live contains over 100 billion stars and is so large that even moving at the speed of light, it requires 100,000 years to travel across it. Go ahead. Is that here the Milky Way? Uh, yes. The Milky Way Milk? is uh, neighbor to Milky Way. 
And you can find it if you go to Illinois, or some of you may be Illinois. Christy likes to correct my language, right? I often lay my head at night on a pillow, where she often lays her head on a pillow. So it just depends, you know, on the verbiage, right? But she washes her clothes, so I'm not sure, you know, what she's bringing up here, so. Okay, so while the size of the universe is impressive, right? Its design is even more impressive. The temperature inside the sun is estimated to be over 20 million degrees Celsius. The Earth, however, is located at exactly the correct distance from the sun to receive the proper amount of heat and radiation to sustain life. If the Earth were moved just 10% closer to the sun, about uh, 10 million miles, far too much heat and radiation would be absorbed. If the Earth were moved just 10% farther from the sun, too little heat uh, would be available, and either situation would spell doom for Earth. The Earth is rotating at its axis at 1,000 miles per hour, and at the equator, uh, and, and simul simultaneously moving around the sun at 70,000 miles per hour, approximately 19 miles per second. While the sun and its solar system are whirling through space at 600,000 miles per hour at an orbit so large that it is estimated it would take over 220 million years for it to complete just a single orbit. Interestingly, however, as the Earth moves in orbit around the sun, it departs from a straight line by only one-ninth of an inch every 18 miles. Well, why does that matter? Well, if it departed one-eighth of an inch, we would come so near to the sun, we'd be incinerated. If it departed just one-tenth of an inch, um, we would be, uh, find ourselves so far from the sun that we would freeze to death. Either way, you're not going to sustain life. The Earth is about 240,000 miles from the, from the moon. Well, why does that matter? Because the moon is what controls our gravitational, uh, or the gravitational pull of the moon is what produces our ocean tides. If the moon were moved closer to the Earth by just one-fifth, the tides would be so enormous that twice a day, uh, they would reach 35 to 50 feet and cover most of the surface of the Earth. Thus, not sustaining life. What would happen if the rotation of the Earth were cut in half or doubled? Well, if it were cut in half, the seasons would be doubled in length, which would cause such harsh heat and cold over the Earth that it would be difficult, if not impossible, to grow enough food for the Earth's population. If the rotation rate were doubled, the length of each season would be halved, causing the same similar situation of a food shortage. The Earth is tilted on its axis at 23.5 degrees, if that tilt were reduced to zero, much of the Earth's water would accumulate around the two poles, leaving vast deserts in its place. If the atmosphere around, uh, surrounding the Earth were much thinner, meteorites would strike our planet with greater force and frequency, causing worldwide devastation. The oceans uh, provide a huge reservoir of moisture. They are constantly evaporating and condensing, thus falling upon the land as refreshing rain. It is well known that the fact of the water, the, uh, it's well known fact that the water heats and cools at a much slower uh, rate than land mass does, which explains why desert regions can be blistering hot in the daytime and freezing cold at night. Water, however, holds its temperature longer and provides a sort of natural heating and air conditioning system for the land areas of the earth. Temperature extremes would be uh, much more unpredictable than they are now if approximately four fifths of the earth were not covered with water. In addition, humans and animals uh, inhale oxygen, exhale carbon dioxide. On the other hand, plants take in carbon dioxide and give out oxygen. We depend upon plants for our oxygen supply, and yet we fail to realize that 70% of our Earth's oxygen comes from the tiny plants and microorganisms in the sea. And so if our oceans were much smaller, we wouldn't have enough air to breathe. Can a person reasonably expect to believe that such exacting requirements that are required to sustain life on Earth just happen by accident, right? If you find design in nature, there must be a designer, right? If you find code in nature, there must be a programmer, right? And so it just kind of, you go back to look at what uh, Brother Harib had to say in his book, this is actually a different book uh, uh, through Jeff Miller uh, and I want to say it's uh, Brad, uh, not Brad here, Jeff Miller and Kyle Butt actually put this book together and so where a lot of this information comes from. And so, like I said, I mean, the earth is exactly the right distance from the sun. The moon is exactly the right distance from the earth. 
Um, it has exactly the right diameter. It has exactly, the Earth has exactly the right atmospheric pressure, the, the, exactly the right tilt, exactly the right amount of oceanic water, exactly the right mass. And so you, just, you add all these things up and you look at it and you say, what's, you know, if, if you were to look at any other thing in life with this sort of exactness, if you will, and then, and then just, and then somebody, somebody would, you would tell somebody, it just, that happened by chance through a cosmic explosion, it just happened by chance. They would, they would literally that, they would uh, attribute that to just being ludicrous, right? And yet it's only because there's the, the idea of a God in the situation that people would look at this and say, well, and they start to come up with all of these other theories. So I know these are things that we've probably heard before, but maybe it's been a minute since we've heard some of these things before. The problem is, is how often do we consider these things as we, can, uh, as we think about the Word of God? And so if you have your Bibles open to Romans chapter 1, after all of that information, I want you to read Romans chapter 1 and verse 20 again. Romans chapter 1 and verse 20, I want you to read that again. Brethren, it is, is, to me, it is just painfully obvious that there's an intelligent designer, and we call him God. In Romans chapter 1, in verse 20, I want you to see what the scriptures say. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that we are without excuse. You look at Roman verse one, uh, Roman chapter one and verse twenty, and then you look at that verse. What do you make of that verse in conjunction with what I just read to you this morning? Thoughts, Lewis. God is. Uh, we should be so in awe with God's existence. All the things you just talked about, and it all focuses back on one thing. God created us to have all this around us. And we should wake up every morning taking that deep breath of oxygen and say, oh, thank you, plants. Yeah. But more than that, thank you, God. God wants us to <clears throat> take it off the surface. We are surface thinking people sometimes mm -hmm. as Christians because we, I believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It's more than that. Mm -hmm. Jesus is the creator of the universe. Yeah. This is his toy. And we are his kingdom. And all he asks us to do is reflect him in our lives. Amen. Any other thoughts? Gina? Exactly. God, it backs up what God said, because God did not leave himself without witness. Uh, I seen Jim and then Tom. Go ahead, Jim. Okay, well, I, I was just going to say that, uh, you know, what's it, like Occam's razor or something, that sometimes the, the simplest explanation is usually the right one, Yeah. right? Uh, you know, the, the pew that uh, most of us are sitting on, like, it has no moving parts if it's working correctly, right? But the, if I was <laughs> to suggest that that was just created out of the available goods in the universe, uh, you would think I was an idiot. Yeah. And if I was like, no, 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 but it took millions of years for that pew to just magically create itself out of the, the, the universe, uh, you would still look at me like I was an idiot. Yeah. But something like the human hand that is so intricate that we cannot create a machine that can replicate its functionality, people believe can happen by accident. Yeah. That's not a normal, logical thought process. Exactly. Tom? <clears throat> you can look all you want, but the other proofs are right in front of us every day. People still go out of their way to make up stuff. Yeah. Why? Well, well, there can't be a, there can't be a God. So let's how how intricate can I be? How precise can I be about creating some other explanation? Like uh, let's see, there was just a pop. Of course, they don't tell us how this bang happened, how this pop happened. Yeah. And something popped and wow, just well, it took again billions of years, but uh, eventually from that pop, there were oceans and there were planets and there were stars and there were even pews. And yeah, there were hats and gloves and all that kind of thing. I mean, you've got to be an idiot to think that yeah. deep. 
or you've got to really believe in the odds and you should be spending all your time at the racetrack. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> Diane and then Christy. Um, when, I, when I personally look at this verse, I think of God has given us things that we can be in awe about. Mm -hmm. If you really sit and look at in the night watch the movement of the moon, which is not the movement of the moon, but the movement of us, or if we watch a bug in the grass, or what if God has given us enough that if we really sit and look, he's given us the proof in that he is the creator. Amen. Just by watching and looking, he's, he's, he's given us something that can draw us in to sit and wonder about him. Absolutely. Christy? Uh, sometimes I wonder if we're just, uh, because the world has like progressed so much, like um, what's the word? Technologies. Technologies and stuff like that. Sometimes I wonder, are we just so far removed from, like when we live in Iowa, mm -hmm. we coming from here, like there was a whole new appreciation for farming. People there understood like uh, the importance of farming because they're the ones growing from God. Yeah. You know, harvesting uh, cows and pigs, all of that stuff. Like they're right there. We're like, we're just like, I just give the grocery store money, yeah. and I get the food. Yeah. So therefore, like, it, we're kind of removed from the creation <coughs> itself, and we're just like, we're, we're getting like the processed version. <coughs> so therefore, we just we can't sometimes. I don't know. No, I know exactly what, what you're saying. So Lloyd Lloyd used removed. to say he would often say. Kids in the in, in, you know in the Midwest that live in the farming communities uh, deal with life and death better. And why would you say something like that? Well, because they're dealing with life and death on a regular basis, right? Because they understand that you know I go to the grocery store and I buy some steaks, I buy some T-bones, you know, I buy some different things, and I go home and I never really consider and think about where that T-bone came from. I just you know it's a good, tastes good if you prepare it right and you cook it correctly. But there, you know what I mean, they actually raise them, they slaughter them, they process them, uh, and then the cycle continues to repeat itself, and they're growing the food. And so, you know, life and death, they, they don't, you know, they look at it differently. And so, you know, to, to what Christy's saying is, how often do you really consider the air you breathe? The fact that, you know, you know we breathe, take in oxygen, we expel carbon dioxide, the plants take in the car carbon dioxide and give off oxygen. You know, it's, there's a give and take thing there, right? But how often do you consider the water that you drink? How often have you ever even known that 70% of the Earth's oxygen come from the microorganisms in the sea? And most people would probably say, no, I have no idea about that. Um, hold on, we have Kim first. Sometimes when I go for walks, it's just a <coughs> walk. I'm not looking at all God's creation and appreciating it. Yep. I find that when I wake up and I spend time with God, first thing in the morning, before I head out, I have a better appreciation for all creation. Yeah. Everything that, and that I'm in my mind, I'm thanking God yeah. for everything. When we just start out the day and just get up and go and don't give thanks to God, I think sometimes, like Lewis said, you know, he wakes up, thank you for this air that I'm breathing and the plants that create it. Sometimes we're just in too much of a rush. Yeah, absolutely. That reminds me of when I was in Utah. I was flying out to uh, Orange County, California for a national sales convention. And, and I had a layover in Utah. And I've never been to Utah. And I'm looking out you know, at the Rocky Mountains and everything because they had the airport because of the mountains. They had these huge windows. And I'm just, wow. And, and I remember talking to one of the ladies. And I said, you know, that was uh, uh, at the desk, you know what I mean, That's by the gate. And I said, man, you guys just got to be able to love living out here, just looking at these beautiful mountains every day. And she says, honestly, she goes, after a while, you don't even know that, you don't even, re rec you don't even realize they're there after a while. They're just, you know, you look at them, wow, that's great. And then you move on and you don't even really realize it anymore. You know, here, you know, I'm on Facebook and Barb or John Wallace or Fran or somebody are in, you know, Florida or Arizona and they're posting these, you know, beautiful sunrises and sunsets and all these things. And you're like, wow, that is so beautiful because, you know, Michigan is gray and gloomy for five months. You don't see, you don't even barely see the sun, you know what I mean? But so many times, though, I think when you live in these areas, we just take God's creation uh, for granted. We take life for granted. We take 
uh, what, what it takes to sustain life for granted. So we don't think about a creator. We don't think about you know, code needing a programmer. We don't think about a lot of these things because in the busyness of life, we just take things for granted. And so I think that's kind of what Tom was saying a minute ago, because if you notice at the end of verse 20, it says, so we are without excuse. God has left behind a witness, so we are without excuse. But now look at verse 21. Verse 21 says, and this ties in with what Tom was saying at the end of what he said, for even though they knew God, even though we recognize that we could see a creator in creation, it says they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but instead they became futile in their speculations and their foolish hearts were dark and professing to be wise, they became fools. And it goes on to say, and exchanged the glory of an incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man, of birds, of four-footed animals, of creaching, uh, of four-footed animals and, and crawling creatures, right? And so instead of giving thanks to God for what he has done in the foolishness of our hearts and minds, we, we ignore God and we create our own gods in the foolishness of our hearts. And so that's why it says there in verse 20, we are without excuse. Even if you've never heard of Jesus Christ, you should still believe that there's a God who created us because he has left himself as a witness in all that he has created. Lewis? We should look to the example that Jesus Christ gave us. Mm -hmm. Jesus had to take a break from the world. He went into the garden, went into the mountain, he went off, and he experienced the relationship with his creation. Yeah. The creator was running him nuts his apostles and all these other, he, he had to take a step back. And he said, why am I doing this? Why did I create all this stuff? And this creation encourages in him. We need to let God's creation encourage us and strengthen us and give us the confidence to say, hey, we have something here that you need to see. Yeah. It's kind of like when, when Thomas said, he said, he said, Jesus, just show us the Father and yeah. we'll believe. Yeah. And Jesus says, Thomas, Dude, I've been with you three years, and you say, you, you say, just show me the Father? Paraphrasing, obviously. But he says, I've been with you so long, and you don't recognize me? And so there's a few other things I want to look at before we uh, move on. Astronomy. If you were to look at in Isaiah, and you don't have to turn there, you can if you want, because I'm going to kind of just go through this quickly. If you, or if you want to write these down or uh, look at them later uh, through the video. But in Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 22... We know that astronomy lends credence to the inspiration of the scriptures, right? Which we call the word of God. Because in Isaiah 40 and 22, it says, It is he who sits above the circle of the earth. How did the prophet Isaiah know that the earth was a circle? Or it was a sphere in some of your translations, right? And so, how did he know that? And why is that even an important question? I thought the earth was flat 300 years ago. 300 years ago, we thought the earth was, was flat. What's going on here, right? It wasn't until Columbus, 1492, sailed the ocean blue, right? And you think about that, you know, for how many generations of uh, school kids thought the earth was flat? How many generations of human beings thought the earth was flat? You're going to sail to a certain point, and you're just going to fall right off. And yet, thousands of years ago, in the Bible, Isaiah the prophet mentions the, the, the circle of the earth or the sphere. And so that's important, brethren, because it leads some credence to the inspiration of Scripture. Um, you look at in Job 38, 19, it says, The Lord describes light traveling in a way, a fact that was discovered by Sir, I, Sir I, Isaac Newton not until the early 1700s. Think about that. Job wrote about something, it was, it was written about thousands of years before we discovered it through science in the 1700s. If you think about most of the things that we under, come to understand, it's only been in the last couple hundred years, the last two, three hundred years, that we've really come to a deeper, fuller understanding of a lot of things in the, in the scientific realm, and those things are constantly changing. What we thought we knew is constantly changing as more information comes along, as more scientific data comes along. Uh, Job 38 and 24 says, where is, the, uh, where is the way that the light is divided? Well, what is it talking about? Here God asks Job the question uh, about the way that light is divided. 
And yet, we didn't even understand what that meant until just recently. Sir Isaac Newton in the 1700s discovered uh, this by passing sunlight through a prism. It separated light into seven individual bands of color, which we know as Roy G. Biv. You guys remember Roy G. Biv? Right? What is, what, what are the, what is the acronym? You guys are going, right? And the going violet, right? Right, G. Biv, right? But that wasn't even discovered, you know, but yet Job, God is talking to Job. He says, you know, were you there when, uh, basically when I, when I divided the light? You know what I mean? And then we figured out that if you put it through a prism, you know, 17 or actually probably 3,000 years later from Job to, you know, Sir Isaac Newton, right? Uh, that when he figured this out scientifically through experimentation, what about physics? In at least three places in the Bible, there's the indication is given that the earth is wearing out like an old garment. In Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 6, the Bible tells us, Lift up your eyes to the sky, then look to the earth beneath, for the sky will vanish like smoke, and the earth will wear out like a garment, and its inhabitants will die in like manner. But my salvation will be forever, and my righteousness will not wane. We also know that in Hebrews 1 and 11, it says they will perish, but, you're, but you will remain, and they all will become uh, old like a garment. In Psalm 102 and 26, it says, even they will perish, but you endure, and all of them will wear out like a garment, like clothing. You will change them, and they will be changed. And so the idea, the indication here in Scripture is that the earth is going to wear out like an old garment. Well, why is that important? What, why do those Scriptures even matter? Well, it matters because... Uh, there's the little things called scientific laws that we talk about. And this is exactly what the second law of thermodynamics teaches. That as time progresses, entropy or disorder increases and resources begin to run out. So what the scriptures were saying back in, uh, back in Isaiah, or yeah, Isaiah 51 and 6, uh, and in Psalms, and in the, uh, what is the other one, Hebrews 1 and 11, you look at that, and we know that what the scriptures taught thousands of years ago matches up perfectly with what we know the second law of thermodynamics to be. Well, why does that matter? Because the scientific laws have been proven, and they're only laws because they've never been disproven. And no matter where they've ever been studied, they've always been proven correct. That's why we call them laws, scientific laws. And so you look at these things. Where does this leave the Big Bang Theory? A theory that speaks of a universe that has become more orderly uh, over vast periods of time, over multiplied millions and billions of years, they're saying that the Earth is becoming more orderly, and yet the scriptures and the second, the second law of thermodynamics agree and talk about entropy, disorder, that the Earth is wearing out. The resources of the Earth are becoming less and less. And so uh, if you have ever looked at, if you, you know, with the whole green energy debate right now versus fossil fuels and things like that, I can't remember the exact numbers, but I think they said just America alone has enough oil to, to run our nation for, I think it was like 150 or 200 years or something. It was some big number, right? But what's the point? Well, if we only focused on our oil, we got enough for a minute, but about 150, 200 years, it's gone. Well, why? Because it's running out. The earth is going to wear out like an old garment that gets, you know, thrown away. And eventually the Lord is going to come. He's going to return. And so these are just a lot of different things that we can look at. Uh, there's the area of oceanography. In the book of Psalm, in Psalm 8 and verse 8, it says, The birds of the heaven and the fish of the sea, whatever passes through the paths of the sea. And so, well, why is that important? Well, it mentions the various paths in the sea. There was a gentleman by the name of Matthew Morey who set out to discover, after reading his Bible, he set out to discover the paths of the sea. And Matthew was so successful that now at the U.S. Naval Academy, there's a statue of this man for his work in going out and, and, and researching and discovering the paths in the sea that he read about in his Bible. But the Bible had already confirmed this information thousands of years earlier. So how did Job, how could you know, the writer of Job know that there were these paths in the sea. Here it is right here. Oh, you. You're okay. So how could the writer uh, of Job know about these paths in the sea? And so in Psalm 30, or Job 38 and 16, it says, Concerning the sea, God asked, Have you entered the springs of the sea, Job? Have you walked in, have you walked in search of the depths of the sea? 
Well, depths just means it's translated the recesses of the deep. And so the sea bottom is divided into three uh, distinct areas. You got the continental shelf, you got the continental slope, and you have the ocean floor. Well, the continental shelf has numerous hills, ridges, terraces, and even canyons that are larger than the Grand Canyon. Many mountains uh, under the sea are higher than the highest mountain here on Earth, Mount Everest, that's 29,000 feet. There's mountains in the sea that are higher than that. And so all oceans except the North Pacific are divided by an almost continuous system of mountains, uh, and the largest being the Mid-Atlantic Mid Range. The depths of the sea is profound. The, deep, the deepest known point that we know of through technology is 36,198 feet. And so you think about that, 36,198 feet deep. We learn about this. Uh, a lot of these stats came from the, uh, according to the Museum of Science uh, on their websites. Um, although science and oceanography confirm the reality of awesome canyons, recesses, or mountain ranges of the oceans, even yet our knowledge of the oceans is so extremely limited, being that we've only explored a very small percentage of the oceans. But what's the point of all of that information? Without the creator's knowledge, how could the writer of Job have known about these oceanic truths? Did they have the technology in the submarines to go down and the oxygen and the oxygen tanks and all of the equipment to go down and search the depths of the sea, the recesses of the sea to find out about these great canyons and things like that? That the gentleman, uh, Matthew Morey, that he went and did it, but it was just in the last couple hundred years with technology? You see, brethren, how could they have known these things? It talks about the springs in the sea. The springs in the sea are freshwater deposits uh, or pockets or pools in the ocean that come from, the, from underneath, that spring up from the ground, uh, from, from the earth's crust. It comes up, and then even in the midst of great <coughs> amounts of, of, of salt water, you have freshwater springs in the middle of the ocean. The Bible wrote about these things. It talked about these things thousands of years ago. And yet we just, we just found them a few hundred years ago ourselves. And so you'll see it in the oceans. They have Navy ships and they have cruise ships that they'll, they'll literally go over these freshwater springs and they'll, they'll line up a lot of times like gas station and they'll refill freshwater supplies in their ships. Well, how did Job know about it? Well, there's this little thing called a creator, right? God, in, in chapters 38 through 42 of the book of Job, when Job was, even though he, he maintained his integrity, and as he was answering the, the, the arguments of his friends, right, and as he was giving a response, he basically formed his response in such a manner that it almost required God to give a response. But I don't really believe that he ever thought that God was going to come down and give him an actual response. And God did. And then he realized, really, how foolish he was and how little he actually knows about anything. And so... Brethren, I, I, I'm only pointing all of these things out because what is the, f the, the first foundational pillar of Christianity? There's a God. And the second one is the Bible is his word. And the third one is Jesus is his son. And so next week, as we get into the next pillar, and I just wanted to, I mean, there's so much more really we could give you, but I mean, I think this proves the point, right? And so we give you all of this information so that you can know that there's a creator and that you can know that God left himself with a witness and that we, his creation, are without excuse, as it says in Romans chapter 1 and verse 20. Uh, something else I think about. Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 1 and verse 7 says, All the rivers flow into the sea, and yet the sea is not full. To the place where the rivers flow, they flow again. King Solomon tells us, that all the rivers run into the sea, but the sea isn't full. By itself, this statement doesn't really seem that significant until we had the, the, the dawn of satellites. And through satellite imagery, guess what we find through satellite imagery? That all the, all the rivers flow into the sea. And yet, and then they continue to go back in this whole continuous cycle. Well, what's it talking about? Talking about the water cycle. Oh, something we just discovered in the last couple hundred years. And so, and yet it was made thousands of years, or, or you think about what was made uh, and, and talked about in scripture thousands of years ago has just been now made known. 
Uh, Ecclesiastes 11.3 says, If the clouds are full, they pour, they, they pour out their rain upon the earth. Amos 9 and 6 says, The one who builds his upper chambers in the heavens has founded his, has founded his vaulted dome over the earth. He who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out over the face of the earth, the Lord is his name. So when you analyze Ecclesiastes chapter 1, chapter 11, Amos chapter 7, we quickly begin to realize that they're talking about the water cycle that wasn't discovered till the 1600s by European scientists. And yet, it was already being spoken about in the Word of God thousands of years ago in places like Amos and Ecclesiastes. So brothers and sisters, you look at all of this information, um, I mean, let's look at one more. we got a few more minutes. Go back to, like, Genesis 6.15 for a second. You get back to Genesis, and there's more that I have to, that I could give you. I have a lot more notes here. And if you guys ever want this to add to your, uh, Randy ordered uh, three-ring binders. We can pass these out whenever you're ready. Yeah, we, go ahead and pass those out. Because what I'm going to have Karen do, Karen? <laughs> what I'm going to have you do is I'm going to email you my lessons. For these and then you guys uh, you can email it out in the group email that you always do and then that way at home if you guys are interested you get three hole print or uh, uh, punch them and then punch them in there you'll have all this information and there's more information that I'm not even going to cover here because there's just so much and there's even more that you can add to these binders through your own uh, research and study but as they're passing those out in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 15 the scriptures they tell us this is how you shall make it. This is how you shall make it, the ark. The length of the ark is 300 cubits, its breadth 50 cubits, and its height 30 cubits. Well, a cubit is about 18 inches long. It's basically from the tip of the middle finger to your forearm is about approximately 18 inches. And so the measurements of the ark were it was 450 feet long, 75 feet uh, wide, and 45 feet tall. Well, what's interesting about this simple uh, math equation, right, is Look at Genesis chapter 7 and verse 20 now. Because in Genesis chapter 7 and verse 20, it tells us that the water prevailed 15 cubits higher than the mountains, and the mountains were covered. Well, why is that even important? Well, it's important because if you're a shipbuilder, and, and this comes from Brother uh, Brad Harib's uh, information uh, through the, it's called the flood. He has a, a DVD. It says that if you're a shipbuilder, Half of the ship's draft has to be submerged in the water for large oceanic vessels to keep them from capsizing. So half of the ship's draft has to be submerged in the water. Well, what did I tell you that uh, it said in Romans 6 and 15? That it's 30, 30 cubits high. And what did uh, Genesis 17 or 7 and 20 say? That God prevailed the water over the highest mountain peaks, 15 cubits. What's half of 30? 15! Well, why? Because God knows that if he didn't go that distance over the tops of the highest mountain peaks, it would rip out the bottom of the boat. If you rip out the bottom of the boat, those animals in Noah's family are dead. God knew exactly how high the water needed to go over the, various high, the next highest point on the mountains. Brethren, this would allow the, the, the ark to uh, so, uh, float safely across the, the, the surface of the water without any damage to the boat. Once again, how did the Bible that we, how did the book that we call the Bible know these uh, facts that we learned through engineering and scientific research uh, thousands and thousands of years ago, right? You think about this, brother, and there are many other things that we can look at when it comes to archeology, span uh, bibliography, or uh, I'm sorry, biology, prophecy, miracles being performed, Factual accuracy, of the, factual accuracy of the Bible, and on and on. And I know I'm out of time, but I just wanted to give you this information. I have more information that if, I'll send it to Karen, and then I'll have you email it out, because she has the little group email thing that she could just press a couple buttons, where I would have to sit there and do like 150 typing in the emails. And so she's going to send it out if you want it. Randy and the elders, they ordered our three ring binders. You can print it, three hole punch it, throw it in there, and you'll have all of this information at your disposal. And we're going to continue to add through this as we go through the foundational pillars of Christianity. Next week, we're going to begin to look at the second foundational pillar, and that is the Bible is the Word of God. Let's go to God in prayer. 
Most gracious Heavenly Father, we are so blessed to be able to come together uh, as fellow servants in the kingdom, as fellow uh, disciples, Father, to worship you here this morning, to study your word. We pray that, uh, that as we study your word, as we look at these foundational pillars, Father, that it'll unlock uh, just a deeper uh, understanding and truths of, of who you are and, and, and what you've done, what you've created, and in the plan that you have put in place before even the foundations of the world. Father God, we just pray that as we enter into our worship, it's acceptable in your sight. We pray, Father, that, that each of us uh, will set aside the cares of this world to focus in solely on you this morning, uh, to give thanks uh, for Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Uh, and, and I just pray, Father God, uh, that, uh, that you continue to be with our sister, uh, Brianna Williams. Uh, we continue to be with Roger Bouchot, that you continue to be with Fred. You continue to be with uh, Fred Landry and, and the Lance family. Uh, Teresa Zalea, Father, these are just a, just a handful of the, of the people that are on our prayer list overall here. And we're asking, Father, that you would bless each of those on the list uh, according to their needs. And I know that there's a variety of needs, Father, physically, emotionally, spiritually. And Father, we just pray that, that you who know all things, who know your creation, know exactly what we need before we even ask, that you would send a blessing to each as they would have need. Father God, we love you, and we thank you and ask you for all things. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, everybody. No, I sure do be here. But you know.